Well, good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to this session entitled What's Special About Spanish and Portuguese Synagogue Music? Our presenter tonight, Cantor Elliot Alderman, is one of the few people who is equally at home in both the Sephardi and Ashkenazi world of music. He has held positions as cousin and director of music of the Spanish and Portuguese Jews Congregation, and also as choir master at our Shul Edgeware United, as well as Millhill United and Hendon United. He has directed his own professional choral group, the Rina Assam, comprising some of the best Jewish choral voices in the country. He is one of the very few Chazanim operating in this country with full professional training in both the cantorial arts and in classical voice production. Tonight he will discuss his experience in both the Sephardi and Ashkenazi world of music, contrast some of the differences in approach and style, and illustrate and play examples from each. The Edgeware United Cantorial Sessions are presented in association with the European Cantors Association. Um, so, uh, so this talk um, is, by its very nature, a little bit hefker. In other words, it's uh, it's not really a sort of it's a it's a it's a subject overview rather than specifically uh, a kind of. Can, can I be seen? Okay, you all see me, all right. Uh, um, rather than a sort of sequential, because there is no sequentiality to it. So, by that very nature, if anyone at any point has any questions, do feel free to shout out or scream out. Um, and ask, and if I can answer, I will, because if, if, you, if I forget where I am, then I might not remember to come back to it at another time, and it doesn't really matter, because there's plenty to talk about, and we probably won't have time to talk about everything that I had in mind to talk about anyway. So we are talking about um, what's special about Spanish and Portuguese synagogue music, and I suppose I thought I'd answer that question with relation to uh, a few different areas. Um, and with relation to what I imagine the most of my audience this evening are familiar with, although I'm aware that there'll be others um, watching this on YouTube after the event who may, who may be familiar with the different types of uh, community and community organization. Um, we're currently in Edgeware United Synagogue, which is a straight down the line United Synagogue Ashkenazi congregation in London. Uh, there'll be other people from different um, types of congregation across the world. And if anyone has any questions either here in the audience that you don't get a chance to ask this evening or you think later you wish you'd asked, or if anyone watching the recording has any questions, do feel free to email me. You can get my email just from my website, www.chazanelliotalderman.co.uk. Just remember that Chazan is C-H-A-Z-A-N, and Elliot has one L and one T. So we are talking about um, the Spanish and Portuguese synagogue, and we have a little illustrative example here. This is a woodcut, I think, of uh, Bevis Marx Synagogue in London. Um, what is the Spanish and Portuguese Jews congregation? Well, it's not, as its name implies, Jews coming from Spain and Portugal now, um, but it is Jews who came from Spain and Portugal several hundred years ago. Uh, Bevis Marx Synagogue was opened in 1701 in the east end of the city of London. Uh, it is a successor to a pre-existing congregation around the corner in Creed Church Lane, which has been, been there since the mid-1650s. Uh, and the, um, the Spanish and Portuguese Jews, this is an offshoot, really, of the congregation in Amsterdam. In a very brief nutshell, um, the so-called Spanish and Portuguese Jews are, broadly speaking, those, who, um, those whose families at the time of the Spanish Inquisition, decided to remain in Spain and Portugal likewise, rather than, uh, rather than be expelled from the, from the country and, and have their possessions confiscated. Uh, quite a number decided to remain in the lion's den, and of course, in order to do that, the, the quid pro quo was they had to convert to Catholicism. So we're talking about what you would call in Hebrew anusim, meaning those who are, or, or in the rather more pejorative term, Maranos in the, in the Spanish, which means pigs, because um, these, um, that is the name that the non-Jews gave to these, to these uh, Jews, I should say, um, because these were Jews who remained Jews in secret. Otherwise, they would be at risk of burning at the stake and all sorts of other horrible tortures. Uh, and so in general, they had no communal life whatsoever under the regime of the, uh, that was supported, supported the Spanish Inquisition. 
um, and they had whatever ceremonies they could manage to maintain um, on their own in their, in their private homes or in secret locations, and that's really all they had. Uh, and these um, so-called Spanish and Portuguese congregations really, really started to appear about 100 years later um, after, after the, the expulsion, the ostensible expulsion of all the Jews from Spain and later Portugal. Uh, towards the end of the 16th century, uh, you started to get... Um, um, <laughs> you started to get congregations um, convening in countries that were more sympathetic to the idea of Jews being in the country. Um, and generally those were, those were Protestant countries. So, for example, um, you had a number in uh, certain parts of Italy, um, but the biggest, um, the biggest congregation uh, was in Amsterdam, because the, um, the, ne the Netherlands was a, was a Protestant country and had no objection to Jews being physically present. And indeed, they were very happy for them to be present because they brought all their business contacts uh, and helped the economy. So these, uh, these, so these Jews were called Spanish and Portuguese Jews to distinguish them from the proper Sephardim, if you want to call them that, um, the ones who who left at the time of the, of the expulsion of Spain, Spain and Portugal and formed their communities all around the Mediterranean uh, in places like the, the Levant, the, um, in, the, in Greece and Turkey. There was quite a large community in, uh, in the Balkans, but there isn't any more for reasons you probably were aware of. Uh, and, of course, North Africa as well. And, um, so... Um, so the Spanish, the so-called Spanish and Portuguese Jews were uh, in, in contradistinction to the other Sephardim because the Spanish and Portuguese Jews were the ones who came directly from Spain and Portugal and spoke Spanish and, Spanish and Portuguese as their lingua franca, lingua franca, if that's the plural, someone, someone will correct me. Um, so um, that's, that's in a nutshell. Um, there's a lot of detail I've left out, um, but generally the... Uh, the um, academic idea seems to be, the consensus seems to be, um, in such as there, is, there is a consensus about these things, that uh, when they were forming their communities, these so-called Spanish and Portuguese Jews, um, they were trying to do it from the bottom upwards, from scratch, because they didn't really have a lot to go on. They certainly had no music, of, like communal synagogue music of their own. They had a very... Um, uh, variable understanding of how to speak and pronounce Hebrew. Um, they had varying levels, very significantly varying levels of Jewish knowledge, although they, they knew they were Jewish, obviously. Uh, and so what they tended to do was to, was to buy in help from rabbis and chazanim from some of the other Sephardi communities around the, around the Mediterranean, and they seemed to have created a sort of, uh, a sort of hybrid whereby they've seen it's really a bit of speculation. There isn't, there isn't an awful lot of fact to go on, but it seems to be that they, um, they have seen or heard, I should say, the, the, um, the synagogue music, the chant, the Sephardi chant that many of you will be familiar with. Um, they seem to have heard it through Western ears because their musical ears were Western because the, the musical milieu of Spain and Portugal at that time was the, the Baroque, if you like. It was the, the high Baroque period. So therefore... What we come out with is this kind of sort of hybrid where it's a sort of, sort of Sephardi-style chant but in Western modes and, and musicality. So it will become clear what I mean when I play some examples, which I'll go straight on to. Um, so um, how... It, what, I haven't got it here. What is special? What is special about it? Well, there's a lot of different things that are special about it. Um, I'll go through some of them. One... Um, to my mind at least, is that they have, um, there are certain special musical compositions which only these communities have. And really in this talk, I'm, I'm primarily talking about the London Spanish and Portuguese community. There are others dotted around the world, not many anymore. Um, but I'm really talking about the London one because we're here in London. Uh, and um, they have certain special musical compositions which are unique to their communities, just like we here in this community have certain pieces that people expect to hear at certain times of year and certain types of service, if they expect to hear them at all. 
uh, they, the Spanish and Portuguese also have, um, have um, similar, um, similar compositions. So the one I'll play you now, this is a, a setting for Mismor de David, that is Psalm 29, as it's, as it's sung on a Shabbat morning where, as the Sefer Torah is being returned to the Ark after reading the Torah. And this is a, um, a sort of special festive setting, and I'll talk more about that in a minute, the idea of these sort of festive settings, but you'll tend to hear it on maybe, let's say, first day of Yom Tov, first day of Shalosh Regalim, or, uh, it could be, or it could be if there's, well, I was going to say if there's a Simcha in Shul, um, but that's usually because there's more people available to sing in the choir on those occasions. So anyway, this is um, by Chacham Benjamin Artom, who was the, the chief, the Chacham, the chief rabbi of the congregation, sort of around the middle, um, uh, middle part of the uh, 19th century, and it's attributed to him. And this is his setting of Mismara David. And it is sung by the Spanish and Portuguese, the choir of the Spanish and Portuguese Jews congregation in a set of records that was, uh, that was released in 1951. Forgive me that I'll have to um, chop many of these off before the end because we don't have time to listen to them all the way through. Um, in case you are wondering, those are all adult men singing in that choir. There's no ladies or indeed boys. Uh, and the, the treble solo in the middle is done by a gentleman. Um, and um, all the soprano parts in the choir are also done by, uh, by gentlemen. Um, that was the style of the time. Um, if we had, if we had uh, falsettists as good as that nowadays, we would certainly use them. Um, so, uh, so there you have um, uh, an example of the sort of style we're talking about. It's kind of, it's, it's, that particular one is very interesting. Um, it shows a lot of, uh, a lot of Western influence. Um, some people have said to me they hear Verdi in there. Well, it was written by an Italian, you know, so at the time. Benjamin Artem was from Italy, so it's quite possible, yes. It has a real majestic processional uh, tan to it. You used the word processional and you're quite right because and it's they're taking the Sefer Torah, the Sefer Torah yeah, back. But it was the right sort of thing to do it for. Right. As you say, as you say the word processional and this is very much the style of the congregation. It's all very um, majestic is the word you used. I would say that's a good way of describing it. Um, 
uh, uh, um, serious, uh, uh, one could come up with all sorts of adjectives, you'll tell me at the end. Um, uh, but in particular, one reason that it's done at that speed, that very specific speed, is because they have demarcated bits of the shawl that they have to be at at a certain point in the song in order, yeah, oh yes, yes, yes. Even there's a place called Vayarkidem Corner because they've got to be at Vayarkidem, the word Vayarkidem in, uh, in the psalm. They have to be at a particular corner of the, uh, well, they call it the, uh, the Teba, we would call it the Bima. Um, so it's all, it's all they, they do like their, um, they do like things, everything being in order and everything being in its place. That's certainly the truth. Um, they're going to say um, that, um, so I said earlier, that um, um, there's certain that this was something you might hear on you know, a special occasion, whatever. Well, what does the phrase special occasion mean? Well, it means different things to different communities. Um, so this leads me on to another aspect which is particularly notable or unique about the, the way this community uses music as contrasted with, let's say, the Ashkenazi communities in general. Um, Whereas Ashkenazim, uh, when it comes to Nusach, that means uh, the way we use chant and music in the, in the prayer services, um, we distinguish very, uh, very strongly and starkly between the way we chant the service on, let's say, a, a Shabbat, an ordinary Shabbat, or the way we do it on weekdays, or the way we do it on Shalosh Regalim, the three festivals that has its own Nusach, um, you know the one, da, 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 ba, 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 ba. you only hear that if you, someone knows what they're doing. You'll only hear that on Shalosh Ragalim or on Rosh Chodesh. Um, and then, likewise, you also have other Nusach for, uh, for Yom Yom Rosh Hashanah, Yom Kippur, certain other occasions during the year. So the, the Sephardim, the Spanish and Portuguese, also distinguish between these different occasions. But they tend to do it rather than, in, not not entirely, but in general, rather than doing it as a complete different way of chanting the service, they'll tend to choose certain special melodies for particular parts of the service that are only going to be done on a special occasion. Which special occasion is down to the chazan or down to the choir master? But it doesn't do more, if you like, than... Just make the congregation aware that, oh, this is something special. It's a, it's, a, it's a special day. It's not a sort of regular, regular routine day, if you like. Um, so, um, and, and the way that they will chant the service, um, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> um, the, the, the regular sort of chant on a Yom Tov of Pesach as compared to a regular Shabbat, there is no difference between them whatsoever. It's all exactly the same chant. And I'm going to play you an example of that later. Um, but when it comes to special occasions during the year, perhaps the way they make uh, a, a most special distinction is, apart from the Shalosh Regalim, when it comes to Simchat Torah and Shabbat Bereshit, they, they treat that as a unit. It's not done in the same, with the same, I've already said that they use the same, what we would call Nusach, they use the same Nusach. Uh, but when it comes to melody, I mean, they use the same nusach for, for Shalosh Ragalim as they do for Shabbat. But when it comes to uh, um, uh, Simchat Torah, they'll use different melodies, melodies that are unique and special for Simchat Torah, and they're also done on Shabbat Bereshit, which is the following Shabbat, because that's also part of the same sort of cycle of finishing the Torah and beginning the Torah again. Uh, and so an example of that is the special L'chad Dodi, um, although, of course, they don't sing that on Simchat Torah, it's not Shabbat. But the melody appears in other prayers. And this is another thing to note, that they have these sort of motifs that go through the whole, the, the whole uh, prayer service. So once, once they've hit on a good tune, you tend to find it sung everywhere throughout the entire service. So although this is a recording you'll hear is for L'cha Dodi, it's also sung in other parts of the service, and you might even get to hear it a bit later as well. And this is specifically for the Shabbat evening of Shabbat Bereshit and another occasion which I'll say in a minute. La-ha.
So, Shabbat Bereshit, and I said there was another occasion. The other occasion on which it's sung varies depending on which synagogue you're in because it's reserved for the Shabbat, whichever Shabbat is the anniversary of that synagogue's opening, the time that they, whichever was the first Shabbat where they held services, that's the Shabbat each year that they will do those special melodies. And it's very similar to the Shabbat Bereshit because it's kind of linked in with this whole, this whole concept of renewal um, and consecration and rededicating ourselves uh, to the Torah. So they have this idea that also the same melodies are used. And you'll find that the, on the, uh, certainly on the Friday evening, not so much the Shabbat morning, but the Friday evening of, of the, this so-called anniversary Shabbat will be quite different to an ordinary, an ordinary Friday evening in the shul. And it will have a lot of these, the same melodies, and one or two of its own as well. So that's as contrasted. I said I would, um, the, the, um, the, the bump did say that I would contrast with, uh, with some of the Ashkenazi melodies. So as I've said, um, the way that Ashkenazi will demarcate things uh, tends to be more along the lines of um, different tunes, different nusach for different occasions during the year. So an example would be um, on Shalosh Regalim, Pesach, Shavuot, and Sukkot, uh, Ashkenazim, certainly the, the Yeki Ashkenazim like we have here, the German, uh, the ones of German origin, will have their own special tunes for, for example, Yigdal, uh, um, uh, um, um, the Hallel tunes are all special, and also, um, and those are different, by the way, for each of the Shalosh Regalim, but um, one that's the same for all three Shalosh Regalim is the Kaddish, special Kaddish that you're supposed to do um, after laning on Yom Tov morning, specifically Yom Tov morning of Shalosh Regalim, and it sounds like this. Is not Know who this is? Uh, it's not De Sola, no, no. This is this is J. L. Mombach, Israel Lazarus Mombach, who was the choir master of the Great Synagogue, the Ashkenazi Great Synagogue, Duke's Place, uh, for a large chunk of the 19th century. Most of the uh, no, not most of it, but a good 40 years of it. Uh, um, he, um, the reason I put him up there is because he's, in many ways, uh, responsible for. Um, the way in which the Ashkenazi and Nusach is preserved in the way that we do it here in the UK, in England specifically. Because he, so the Kaddish that you just heard, is the traditional, of course, the traditional Kaddish, the, the, the old Yekish uh, Kaddish for, the, for that occasion that I mentioned on, uh, on the morning of uh, Yom Tov. But it's also the specific recording I played is the way that Mombach transcribed it in his book. So this is the way that he set it 
um, and the way that he set the words and the way that he exactly fit the melody to the words. So that's an example of, um, of, uh, of the way that some of those tunes have been, uh, one hopes they would have been preserved anyway, it's not, it's not a guarantee, but certainly by having it there uh, transcribed in that way, it gives us, a, uh, it gives us a, 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 an insight into how it was done then and, uh, and the way that we can now do it in our synagogue today. Um, so so uh, Mombach is very important from that point of view. Um, what else is important is that he, um, his shul was one minute's walk from Bevis Marks, basically on the same road. And there was a lot of uh, cross, uh, well, cross contamination, if you want to put it that way, across <laughs> cross cultural pollination, um, like it or not. And there are certain tunes that the Ashkenazim now sing, which are, which are definitely taken from the uh, Spanish and Portuguese repertoire. For example, the way that uh, uh, the way that we uh, in the United Synagogue sing the Shira on this coming Shabbat. Um, that is the Spanish and Portuguese melody for it. Uh, um, and, and some of you will also recognize the same tune as Bendigamos. Bendigamos al Antissimo, al Señor que nos crió. The Chira came first, funnily enough. So, uh, so back to Spanish and Portuguese music, um, synagogue music, um, an equivalent um, melody in the Spanish and Portuguese that would be reserved for certain, certain times of year uh, would be the Yigdal for... Um, they have a Yigdal that's specific to Shalosh Regalim, but the one I'll play you now is the one um, that is specifically for, uh, for Yamim Noraim, Rosh Hashanah Yom Kippur. Whereas the Ashkenazi one, I'm sure you all know, will be Yigdal Elohim Chai Ve'yishtabach Nimsa ve'yene ezel metziuzah Echad ve'en yachid Ke'yichudo Ne'elam ve'gam entzov le'ach duto I'm sure you all know that one. If you've been to Kol Nidre, uh, that's, the, that's the, the, the melody that's sung. Um, whereas the Spanish and Portuguese, of course, have their own melody, which is also specifically reserved for Rosh Hashanah Yom Kippur. The interesting thing about this one is it's borrowed. Like I said earlier, they like a good once they found a good tune, they'll just play it. They'll just do it for everything. So I'll go back to my nice picture of Bevis Marks here, if I can. There you go. Uh, and um, this one is borrowed from a piyut. A piyut excuse me. And that the, uh, most Sephardim actually say, um, and the Spanish and Portuguese are no different in this regard, on, the, on the, the morning of Rosh Hashanah, both days of Rosh Hashanah, it's the introduction to the sounding of the shofar. So it's a very uh, a moment of intense spirituality, uh, and it's a point where really everyone who's going to be in shul is in shul by that point, so everyone knows the tune. Uh, and it's called Eshare Ratzon. It's a, it's a quite lengthy poetic retelling of the story of the Akedah, uh, and, and the tune is borrowed here for, for, uh, for Yigdal on the evenings. Um, the way it's presented here um, is slightly abbreviated, so we're not going to go through the whole, uh, uh, the whole Yigdal piyut, but uh, it includes the um, two particular things to note. Those who are not familiar with uh, the way Safadim sing Yigdal should note that there's an extra verse. After Metim Yechai Ekel Baruch Hasto, Baruch De Adshem Tihilato, then there's Ele Shalosh Esrele Ikarim, Hinam Yusod Dat El Vatorato. These are the 13, uh, the 13 principles, Maimonides' 13 principles in the Ikarim, in the, in the, uh, the essences. Hinam Yusod Dat El, this is the, in them is the, uh, the, the, the essence of the Yusod, the, 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 the root. How would you translate Yusod? The, uh, the, uh, the, the law, you know, the, 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 the foundation, that's a good word, the foundation of the dat, of dat kel, of the, 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 the wisdom of God, or knowledge of God, I should say. Uh, the Torah, I know if it's Torah, so it's a way of bringing them together. So you'll hear that pasuk sung by a boy soloist, and then they then repeat metim, <clears throat> the same way we re repeat metim. Then, the way it's then done on this recording is the way that you would hear it if you were in synagogue for the evening of Kippur on Kal Nidre night because then the Chazan then repeats the last couple of verses as well in a, in, in a sort of ornamented version of the melody. That's another specific trait 
of Spanish and Portuguese music, you'll find that they often, having finished the melody, then the chazan goes back and repeats the last bit in a sort of ornamented form. service on the evening of Kippur. It's really very, very intense and very uh, uplifting to be there, I can tell you. Uh, so I said I would also speak about um, another way that, uh, that melodies are reused. And I want to speak about um, the way the, um, the tefillah uh, is, is done in general. And this is a general difference between Ashkenazim and Sephardim, that it, for the most part, Sephardim will... Uh, chant everything out loud. Um, if, it's a, if it's a congregational part of the prayer, which most parts of the prayer are, the only exception being maybe the, uh, the private Amidah, the Shemona Esrei, um, everything else is done, chanted out loud by the Chazan, or in some cases it's sung together by the congregation. Uh, and um, there is none of this, what happens in the Ashkenazi, you tend to sort of top and tail each paragraph. You sort of... Ah, Vasadam is... At the end, and everything else in the middle gets mumbled. So that makes it quite difficult sometimes to keep up with Chazan, depending how fast the Chazan is going. Uh, so Sephardim have a, the, uh, uh, do it differently. They do everything out loud, and you either read along word for word with the Chazan, or you can just listen to the Chazan. So if many people, if you can't, 
if, if, if some people are not able to read the words for themselves, they can simply listen to the Chazan and fulfill their obligation that way. Um, they do still have to say certain parts themselves as well, but this is not a halachic talk. Uh, the, um, they also take it a bit further um, when it comes to the Amidah uh, at certain times of the week. Um, they will always do the Amidah as a Hecha Kedusha for Mincha on weekdays. I'll explain what I mean for those who don't understand what I mean. Uh, but um, on Mincha of weekdays and on Musaf on Shabbat and most Yamim Tovim as well, there will always be a Hecha Kedusha. What does that mean? It means that, uh, in the way they do it at least, it means everyone reads the Amidah together. The Chazan reads it aloud and the congregation joins in with him word for word for the first three brachot and the Kedusha. And once they reach the end of the third bracha, people then go, go silent and do the rest for themselves. Why do we do that? Because people have got no patience these days. If you've got no patience, no one's listening to the Chazan, and it's the same in the Middle Ages. This all comes from the Shita of the Rambam. Again, I'm not a halachist. I'm not trying to say anything that's going to contradict, I hope, what the, what the Rav of the Shul will say, but I think it's, it's pretty well known, the, response, the famous response of the Rambam, who was asked by the great synagogue in Alexandria, what do we do about the fact that when it gets to Musaf on Shabbat, no one is listening because they're all folding up their talis and ready to go out for the Kiddush. And, uh, and, and no one's listening to the Chazam when he's repeating the Amidah. So the Rambam said, well, then don't repeat the Amidah in that case. Because the Amidah is <laughs> it's meant to be everyone doing it for themselves. And then why is it repeated aloud? So that those who are not able to do it for themselves, for whatever reason, can listen to the Chazam's repetition and fulfill their obligation that way. But if no one is relying on that, and everyone's just chatting, and no one is listening to the Chazan, um, then there's really no point doing it. So therefore, do it this way instead. You can still say the Kiddushah, everyone can do it together, and, uh, and then, uh, and then you're, you're covered from both, both sides. So, as I said, they, when you're supposed to do that, the Shah's had to chak. I mean, when, it's, when you're in a tight squeeze, or when, there's, or when you're never going to get the congregation to sit through an entire repetition. So the Spanish and Portuguese have... Uh, have um, um, crystallize this into minhag to say that they assure that no one ever has time um, during the week for mincha. They do for shachrit uh, uh, they have because they can get up a bit early and have a bit more time. When it comes to mincha, you're trying to squeeze it in in the middle of the day, in your lunch hour, whatever, no one's got time. So they always do it as a hecha kedusha. And likewise, the same as the Rambam said on Shabbat morning and Yom Tov morning when you're going to get out for Kiddush, uh, people don't want to hang around, so they do it there as well. So here is um, a recording of how that's done. Um, this is taken, it's quite interesting, uh, from a service uh, that was broadcast by the BBC, BBC Radio, in 1956 for the 300th anniversary of the so-called readmission of the Jews to England. And uh, they did it as a whole special uh, ceremony in Bevis Mark's synagogue. And um, it was done in the way that I've described uh, with, the, um, with the Reverend Abinun, Eliezer Abinun, was the chazan of the congregation. You can see him there in Lauderdale Road Synagogue, but this was in Bevis Marks. Uh, and he did it together with the choir. And you'll hear that he is doing it basically on his own, but he's sort of, people are joining in with him. And they're sort of joining, the choir is joining in with him in harmony under their breath because they're also saying along word for word with him.
played the whole of that. Uh, the reason I, one of the many reasons I like that recording is because it's a perfect exemplar of how things are done when they're done nicely. And you can hear all sorts of beautiful aspects there. Um, one, for Ashkenazim, maybe one notable aspect that I haven't already mentioned is that it's all in um, what we would term the nusach, meaning the, the sort of tonality of the chant, the way the chant is done, the tune that it's done in, is all very major. It's major key. Um, you know, it's sort of in a straight major. As I said before, it's very Western um, in the way that they do the music. Whereas for Ashkenazim, it would be um, it would be more pentatonic. Um, it's also in a kind of majory, but it's not exactly the same. Uh, and it's also generally. Um, you will find all the, the vast majority of the melodies and chants of the Spanish and Portuguese congregations are all in the major. A few are in the minor. 
um, but there isn't really anything in anything else, any other sort of mode. Whereas for Ashkenazim, you come on any Shabbos morning, you'll hear, it's not in major or minor. It's in it's in a, a, a mode which or a scale which is called fragish in in the Yiddish or Ahavaraba. If you're going to be more technical about it, the way that the way that um, uh, academics are, um, and it doesn't really. You don't really find that in sort of Western classical music, that kind of scale. You find, if anything, maybe Eastern European music, you know, traditional folk music of Eastern Europe, that kind of place, which is really where um, the, the, uh, the Ashkenazi, many of them, came from. And even the ones who, uh, who were in Germany were in the sort of eastern part of Germany, um, without going into too much demographics about it. But anyway, there you have an example of the way things are done in the... Um, the, the Spanish and Portuguese for an Amida, which is obviously not recorded very often, so it's very nice. Um, I wanted to um, also talk briefly um, ways in which things are done differently on, uh, on special occasions. Um, and, oh, by the way, in that recording I just played, did anyone notice which tune they sang for the Kedushah? which was all above your heads. It's just the same as the Lechad Odi that we heard earlier in the evening. I told you, once they've got a good tune, they sing it for everything. And I suppose the rationale is that it was a you know, readmission of the Jews to England. It fits in the sort of, the sort of rededication, uh, starting again afresh type of idea. I suppose that was the rationale why they did it on that occasion. Normally, they wouldn't do a sort of tune for the Kiddushah on weekdays. They would just sort of chant through it quite quickly. Um, but I want to talk about um, another interesting way that the, uh, the Spanish and Portuguese communities do things, um, which I haven't seen in any other community, even other Sephardi communities, which is that on certain special occasions, particularly on Yom Tov, but also um, for uh, when there's a chuppah, a wedding, the mincha before the wedding, that's part of the wedding ceremony, usually it's mincha, um, and also when there's a brit minah, uh, they will, what would normally be a mourner's kaddish, will not be a mourner's kaddish, or rather it will be, but instead of being chanted by a mourner or all the mourners, it will be sung together by the entire congregation in, in unison, in a, in a melody. The idea seems to be that on occasions like that, certainly on Yom Tov and these other um, festive occasions, it's not, apparently, it's too, it's too much like putting, putting a dampener on <laughs> to have mourners getting up and, and saying the Kaddish is more, uh, too much of a show of public mourning, I suppose they would say. And therefore, they fulfill the obligation to say Kaddish by, the mourners do, of course, say Kaddish, but they sing it together with everyone else. And it's done in a special tune. Well, there are two tunes. I'll, tr I'll play you one. The first one um, is one that they do, is the, is the normal one, the one that's done on pretty much every occasion that this, uh, this, is that, that this practice takes place. This is also, by the way, taken from the same, um, the same Sarah, the 300th anniversary ceremony. Um, again, they must have, the Chacham must have stretched a point to allow them to do it because it was a special, special festive occasion. Normally it wouldn't be done on weekdays. sing that for most occasions. Uh, on one special occasion, they sing the Kaddish also to a different tune, and that is um, on the very, very last uh, 
prayer service of each of the three Shalosh Regalim. So it will be Mincha on final day of Pesach, second day of Shavuot, and on Simchat Torah. They'll sing it to a special melody, which they call La Despedida, this day, the farewell. Uh, and it's only done for that Kaddish, although the, the London communities have sort of adopted it for a few other bits and pieces on the last day of festivals. They'll also do it for, for, for Hallel and for Enkel Okeno, and it's, you'll hear it here as Enkel Okeno. La Despedida is the, melody of the uh, name of the melody. another interesting aspect of the way to do things. So I think I'm kind of sort of coming towards the end of my slot. We started a couple of minutes late. I want to leave a little bit of time for questions. Um, so and there's more that I could talk about. Maybe I should end with, uh, with a favourite. Uh, I said there were tunes for special occasions, specific tunes uh, that each community uh, sings on its own special occasions and that are unique to it. Um, the one that you will all know, I hope, or many of you will know, from the London Spanish and Portuguese congregation is the Adon Olam by David de Sola. There is David de Sola. Um, he was the Chazan of Bevis Marx through a large chunk of the 19th century, the middle of, from I think, I think about, the 18, the, about 1813, don't quote me on that, um, uh, and, and for, for quite a, a good number of decades. And he composed this melody, it was published in 1857, um, in part of his uh, book that he uh, published of, uh, of melodies of the Spanish and Portuguese uh, Jews. It actually was the, um, it was the first publication of um, British Jewish music ever. Uh, and he included, most of them are traditional tunes, but he said he, he included his own composition here in the hope that it will... Uh, people will enjoy it and use it for devotion and worship uh, and he did get his wish because it's the tune that, me that, that many of you will know from uh, United Synagogue certainly sings it, other congregations sings it or maybe you often hear it on Yom Tov but it could be on any occasion uh, and so he's really got his wish this is also from the 1951 set of records and the soloist is Reverend uh, Abraham Beniso from Gibraltar So, because I want to leave time for any questions. Uh, please, feel free to ask anything that's flitting through your mind. Yeah. One of the things that's always 
interested me on my very scant visits to Sephardi communities is the way that the officiants wear these beautiful top hats and the tabs and, uh, and all that. Now, years ago, when I was a lad in the, the Hoicha Fenster United Synagogue, the officers wore top hats and frock coats and all that. But the officials did. Where does that come from? Um, where does it, the idea of wearing, wearing sort of hats and robes and things? Yeah. Um, I think it comes from the Goyim. <laughs> uh, yeah, I think, uh, look, if you look at old photographs of, uh, I was, the, the one I like best is Chief Rabbi Herman Adler, um, if you, if you, and Nathan Marcus Adler, if you look at them, they're wearing these, they're, they're dog collars, they're wearing dog collars, you know, if I go back to, you'll see if I go back to, well, you can see him there, well, you can't see him so well in the, in this light, but you can see Reverend DeSola here, he's got the, he's, he's got this, uh, what do you call them? The, the cravat. He's got a cravat, a lace cravat. He's got a he's got a tricorn. That it, this was obviously was this was. Nelson. The, what did you say? I thought it was Nelson. But I wouldn't. Nelson. No, Nelson. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I can tell you at the time this. I don't know exactly what exactly what year this was taken. This photograph, but it was not in the early 19th century. I can assure you. Um, it probably was sometime around the end of his life. So we're talking about maybe in the 1880s sometime. Well, the tricorn wasn't common <laughs> in those days. It's a, it might surprise you to learn that there are people in life who don't like change. And Jews particularly, a lot of them don't like change. So it was at the time that this photograph was taken, what you see DeSola wearing there was the accepted official garb of the ministers of the Bevis Marx Synagogue. That's what he was expected to wear. And I think, uh, uh, and there was a whole, there was a whole machloikus, uh, a whole argument in the community when they wanted to change to the top hat. There was actually, there was actually a split in the community over, the top, over, over ditching the tricorn, and there was a, uh, they set up a rival congregation in um, somewhere around Canonbury, I think, um, where they still wore their tricorns, and it lasted for a few decades, uh, and, uh, and Bevis Mark switched to the top hat, and that's now what they still wear there. Uh, I, think, I think it comes from, you, 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 you see these people, um, the, you, particularly, particularly in, the, in the UK, it's, uh, it's also maybe other places in Europe as well, you don't find this so much in America, except in those congregations where they're really, as a strong, uh, a strong link back to the, the, an earlier congregation in Europe, and they're sort of maintaining. Well, they would regard themselves as maintaining the same traditions. Maybe you'll find it in a handful of places. And nowadays, you don't find it here so much. I think they saw that their, that their colleagues in the church were wearing nice robes with dog collars, and they wanted the same thing for themselves. I think that's where it comes from. Basically, yeah, yeah. yeah. But we make it our own. You could say the tunes are as well, some of them. Yes. Late 1800s, the chief rabbi and others' heads were uncovered. Yes. Yeah, they only, and, and even a lot of Sephardim nowadays. No cup, nothing. They, only, they wear it, they wear the couple, and, and I, I know Sephardim, well, religious from Sephardim who do this today, they wear their head covering when they're obviously when they're praying in synagogue or when they're eating making brachos anything like that they wear it otherwise they won't wear it different way of doing things yes sir. I mean, that version of exam a lot I first heard in 1960 when I was in London and I heard for the first time yeah uh, yeah, and, and why, why did it become, I mean, I, I said that the Duke's place, Ashkenazi Synagogue, was, to, was uh, 100 yards away from Bevis Marks or thereabouts, so they may have got it from there, or I think it got, I think it got more currency, I've got a picture of Alman here, which I didn't get to show you before, Samuel Alman, you can't see it very well, but that's, you can, he's, he looks at his moustache is prominent enough anyway. So he produced the, um, the second edition of the Blue Book, that is the handbook of synagogue music for the United Synagogue, um, where all, a lot of our tunes come from. He produced the second edition of that in, I think, 1933, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, and he included in that book De Solos Adon Alam. 
So since then, it's become good currency in, uh, in, in the Ashkenazi synagogue choirs as well. And that, I think, is why you hear. But he left out the coda section. You know? But the original version, which you heard in the recording, well, that, that full version is in the original publication, but it's not in Alman's version of the Blue Book. So he chopped it around a bit and rearranged it. Yes, anyone else? No. Well, I have got one or two questions from your lecture. The first is, that, am I right that for the Shira, we use the Sephardi version, but the Sephardim don't use it for the Shira? Correct. They don't use it. They do, no, you're not entirely correct. They don't use it for the Shira when they're reading the Torah. They use it for the Shira when they are um, in Psuke de Zimra. Yes. Every Shabbat and every Yom Tov. But this coming Shabbos, they will not. No, in fact, I've got a, if I'm allowed to play another recording, um, just for interest, I've got um, the way that Reverend Abi Nun, I'll put him back up on screen, uh, was, were, was reading the parasha of the Ten Commandments. So they have a, um, um, a sort of special high chant for when they're reading certain special, special sections of the Torah, like the Shira, like the Ten Commandments, like a section where the, the Shekhinah comes down on the, on the Mishkan. Those are all done to a, to a sort of special high version of the regular laning trop, and it sounds something like this. <laughs> to the regular laning, but I can assure you it's a lot faster than that, and it's not so flowery and uppy and downy and twirly, yeah. Um, another point from your lecture. Have I read that some of the Sivari Sidurim have two extra lines go down along? Yes, uh, they do. Um, the Spanish, in fact, there's more. There's, there's about 10 verses to Adon Alam, if you want to search through the, through the Genizos. Um, but the Spanish and Portuguese and many Sephardim do at least... Um, one extra verse, which will be in between the what we have as the third and fourth verses. Um, one second. So they will. So we'll beli reishit beli tachlit v'loha oz v'hamisra. Then they'll say beli erech beli dimion beli shinoi utmora beli chibur beli firud gadol koach ugvora. And then Vahukeli Vahigani, yeah. And that will, yeah, that's in all of their settings of Adonanam, yes. Well, you mentioned Mamba. Um, we no longer sing his Enke Lohenu, whether in the Ashkenazi or the Savani shores, as far as I know. Enke Lohenu, Enke Lohenu, Enke Lohenu, Enke It's never heard now. No, no, you don't hear that one anymore, no. There's plenty of tunes you don't hear anymore. There's no tunes like the old tunes, that's what I say. 
But it's not just in the Sephardi shawls that there's a um, uh, controversy over top hats. When I became one of the honorary officers in Wembley in 83, we decided to take our top hats off. And in the 1984 AGM at the election, uh, the elections then, the main, um, the main motion was whether the honorary officer should restore the top hats again, and the congregation won, and we had to restore them. <laughs> so <if you're> right. <laughs> um, so I'd like to thank Elliot for, his, uh, for this expert insight into the Sephardi Cantora world of music and looking at some of the differences from those we are accustomed to in, in our Ashkenazi services. He speaks with expert knowledge and is able to bridge the gap between, um, between both traditions. I think for many of us, the, uh, um, this content was very new to us. Thanks also to Tony Honigberg for downloading and preparing all the recorded music. Details of the Edgeware sessions are placed on our website www.edgewareu.com or alternatively you can contact our office, office at edgewareu.com and ask to be placed on the circulation list for the adult education program. Recorded past sessions are on our Edgeware US YouTube channel and this session will be uploaded to YouTube fairly soon. Once again, thank you Elliot for your presentation tonight. Thank you. Thank you.